so uh, Ben asked how I'd like to be introduced. I said, uh, you know, you could mention that, uh, you know, I got my undergraduate degree from MIT uh, in aerospace engineering and then my PhD and then went to work for NASA. And then I had to break it to him that that was all BS. None of that was true. Um, the truth is a little less amazing. Uh, I, I was fortunate to uh, have been born here in Huntsville. Uh, I, uh, about the th same time that uh, the uh, space, ah, there, there we go. About the same time that the space, uh, that NASA was founded. Um, and, uh, and so then after graduating from Grissom High School, that was named after Gus Grissom, who of course perished in the Apollo 1 fire. Um, uh, I, uh, I went to the University of Alabama. Hmm. If we turn it there, and um, there we go. That's better. And uh, got a business degree from Alabama. Uh, then started a career in, in uh, advocacy and public policy. Uh, I, I went to work for the chamber in 1991, and I do some kind of hybrid version of government affairs and uh, economic development. Uh, my dad was the first space reporter to work for the Huntsville Times. Um, and so he started there in, in, in the late 50s and um, went on to write a couple of books about space. And, um, and, uh, and then uh, most of which were funny stories about, collections of funny stories about uh, the space program. But he did write a very, very serious uh, biography of uh, Werner von Braun uh, uh, titled Dr. Space. So uh, Steve, who's helped organize the conference, uh, kind of framed uh, what he'd like uh, for me to talk about today, and that is, you know, Huntsville's connection to the space industry is, is kind of deep and enduring, but, but, you know, what does the future hold for Huntsville? And there's kind of some, I guess, expectation about, um, you know, certainly challenges that exist. So let's start with a little background on, on Huntsville and our role with space exploration. Um, first up, our nickname, the Rocket City. Uh, it was May the 13th of 1953, uh, when the Huntsville Times reported that the Chamber of Commerce was releasing a new map and brochure about the city, declaring the, the nickname of the city would be the Rocket City. Previously, we had been known as the, uh, as the watercress capital of the world, so this was kind of a big step up. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in Huntsville uh, in the 1960s, and as the crow flies, uh, my home was about 10 miles uh, from where the test stands are located, where the where the Saturn V rocket was being tested. You know, I felt the ground shake uh, as they uh, were testing those engines that would eventually take us to the moon. So um, that rocket was designed and developed here by Dr. Wunder von Braun. Um, uh, his team had moved here in 1950 from Fort Bliss, Texas, where they had located uh, immediately after World War II. And they were put on Redstone Arsenal, which was the site of an abandoned chemical core uh, operation. Um, uh, it was kind of a remote location. It was really big, 40,000 acres, um, and, but it, it had kind of most importantly, in addition to a lot of space and some relatively new facilities, uh, access to river transportation, which you were going to need if you're going to be building really big stuff uh, like rockets. So that was the home of the Army's Ballistic Missile Agency, and, and in addition to developing uh, the Army's missiles, this team also built the Redstone and the Jupiter C. Uh, that was the rocket that the U.S. used in 1958 to respond to the Sputnik uh, uh, launch. And you see a picture of it there on the right. That same uh, vehicle was used um, in 1961, uh, and you see it on the far left, just to kind of put it into some context, uh, to launch Alan Shepard into space, although it was a suborbital trip uh, of course, that was after the Russians had launched Yuri Gagarin in 1961. By 1958, uh, Dr. Von Braun and his team had started working on the Saturn V rockets, or the Saturn rockets. In 1960, Dr. Von Braun and 4,000 of his fellow Army employees traded their NASA badges, or traded their Army badges for NASA badges, and the Marshall Space Flight Center was born uh, there as a 1,900-acre enclave on Redstone Arsenal. 40,000 acre Redstone Arsenal. So, uh, so Redstone continues its role in, in the Army's missile development and missile defense, although there's a whole lot more that goes on on the Arsenal besides just missiles and missile defense. 
So for the Apollo missions, uh, uh, Huntsville was, large, was responsible largely for the development of the launch vehicle itself. So that includes uh, everything except for the, the capsule and the, and the lander. So that inclu includes things like the fuel tank, uh, guidance and control systems, engines, controllers. Um, after Apollo, Huntsville developed the, the Sky Lab, which was the first space station we launched in the 70s. And, uh, and then the space shuttle, and of course our work on the shuttle included the same things that we kind of done for the Saturn vehicle, which was fuel tanks and engines and boosters. We also developed and manufactured uh, th all of the U.S. components for the International Space Station were fabricated at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, we currently manage all the science that's done on the International Space Station, so as it's up there uh, orbiting the Earth. So now. We're going to do a quick lesson in uh, gravity and orbital mechanics. Um, I appreciate that this group is uh, smarter than the average bear, uh, but I want to pose a quick question just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so right now, the space station is orbiting Earth at an altitude of about 250 miles. So uh, how strong is gravity at 250 miles versus here on Earth? Anybody? Go. Almost exactly the same. So it's 97, 98%. So the only reason that the space station doesn't fall to the Earth like a rock is the fact that it's going really fast. So it's going 17,000 miles an hour. So it's in a constant state of free fall. So it's falling just, it's moving just fast enough to keep it from plummeting to Earth and not so fast that it spins out into some other orbit. So, um, so now, um, you know, to get out of low Earth orbit and to get out of Earth's gravitational pull, you have to accelerate to about 25,000 miles an hour. So to lift a mass uh, necessary to carry people and stuff to go to the moon, you need a really big rocket. So now, using our new knowledge about orbital mechanics, we're going to take a look at what's going on in space at these various different altitudes. Um, so space begins at about 100 miles up. Um, the atmosphere is really thin, and you, know, you get that dark blue uh, you know, image of, of, of space. Later this year, there is a, still a thin atmosphere up there, but, um, but that's, that's kind of where officially space begins. Later this year, or, or early next year, we'll see the first commercial suborbital uh, tourist launches by Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic on their new Shepard and the Spaceship 2 vehicles. So those, those rockets are not going to get into orbit. They're just going to go up to the edge of space, and the passengers will get about five minutes of weightlessness. You know, you're weightless from the time that something stops pushing you up until the time something starts slowing you down. So it's going to be about five minutes, give or take. Um, the next step above that, of course, up at that LEO at 250 miles uh, is low Earth orbit. There's a really robust commercial market, you know, to, to be, you know, from 250 miles up to a few thousand miles up, um, uh, all the way up to geosynchronous orbit. From those places, you can, um, you can observe the weather, uh, a whole host of other conditions, you know, fires and stuff like that. We can triangulate our position with GPS, transmit voice, obvious video signals by satellite, and observe heavenly bodies uh, with space telescopes. NASA is slowly moving its human space exploration program out of low Earth orbit, and they're really trying to move more toward deep space. So deep space lies beyond all of these orbits. Um, and for the foreseeable future, it's really kind of the purview of governments. Uh, deep space is not a viable, there, or there isn't a really viable commercial market at this moment. And until we can identify uh, some way for meeting com meaningful commercial opportunities, I, I don't anticipate a big rush to, to uh, deep space. So now that we understand the difference between suborbital, LEO, uh, GEO, and deep space, let's talk about what's going on in Huntsville. And we'll start by talking about rockets. So today we're developing the, um, the SLS rocket. That's the space launch system. That's pictured on either side of the Saturn in different variants. Um, it's, again, it's, so it's roughly the same size as the Saturn vehicle. Um, so uh, 
uh, it's been a kind of a thrill to watch a lot of this hardware get developed over the years. Um, and I've had a chance to go to Michoud to see some parts of it manufactured. Some of it was manufactured here. On the far right, you can see a, a picture of the, of, the heat, of the hydrogen stage of that core stage rocket in the test stand that's out at the Marshall Space Flight Center. So that's being tested right now, even as we, spe even as we speak. The, uh, so testing will begin on the core stage next year. Uh, th this is a picture of a core stage simulator uh, and just to kind of put it into perspective, that's me standing at the end of that core stage simulator. That was also made in Alabama. And the picture on the left <clears throat> shows it being, being positioned at the Stennis Space Center where they're going to just practice handling this big thing. So once they get used to handling it at Stennis, uh, it's gonna, that simulator will move to the Kennedy Space Center uh, in order to let them practice moving that big thing around. So... <clears throat> SLS is the only launch system that's in development now that can lift the Orion space capsule and, and a lander on a lunar mission. So just to be clear, because uh, you know, there's often there's some misunderstandings about you know, who can do what, Elon Musk does not have a rocket that can take uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the capsule that we're developing right now and um, uh, the Orion space capsule and put it into uh, a cislunar, around the moon environment. Uh, th this chart kind of shows the relative lift capabilities for a mission to the moon and a mission to Mars. And if you want to get that capsule that was designed to take people to the moon and to Mars uh, to the moon, you're going to have to have the SLS. So um, the um, <clears throat> so there's really not a commercial market at the moment for, for deep space exploration. Other, you know, NASA is hoping that other people are going to develop some capabilities to take uh, stuff to the moon into that environment. And I'm sure if they pay them enough money, th they will. But, um, but beyond that, I'm not really sure. I was at a conference last week, and uh, there was a presentation on commercial lunar activities. And the guy gave a great presentation showing the vehicles. And the, and I asked him, I said, so, so who, are, who are your customers? Who, who's paying you, you know, to go to the moon? And uh, he said, well, Mexico. And then I'm like, okay, that's not, not really commercial. But, you know, uh, and then he said, well, you know, a time capsule. So I was like, oh, well, that's, you know, certainly it's going to be a rush for time capsules to put stuff on the moon. Um, so I anticipate SLS is going to be a really important part of uh, our, you know, our future space architecture for, for many, many years to come. So besides SLS, how is Huntsville contributing to space uh, launch and space exploration? Uh, so United Launch Alliance, ULA, currently manufactures the Delta and Atlas rockets that's shown in the blue boxes uh, on this chart uh, at the Decatur facility that's just a few miles from here. So, so Atlas and Delta rockets are being manufactured there. And they've started work, uh, actually it was out there not too long ago, and they, they've got um, parts for the new Vulcan rocket. That's uh, shown in the red box. So that's the rocket that's going to replace the Atlas and Delta rockets. Um, and of course, Atlas and Delta were the primary means of getting stuff into space before Elon Musk and SpaceX got into the act. Blue Origin uh, is manufacturing or will be manufacturing uh, their engines, the BE-3 and BE-4 engines, uh, for their new Glenn rockets. Uh, and those are shown in the yellow boxes uh, on the charts there. Um, so those engines are going to be built here, and they're going to be tested uh, at the Marshall Space Flight Center in the old F-1 uh, engine test stand. That was the engine that was used to take us to the moon. So those engines are going to be used both by ULA and uh, I mean, by Blue Origin and ULA. So, um, Airjet, um, Rocketdyne recently relocated their uh, advanced manufacturing center uh, north of Huntsville next to the uh, to Toyota engine manufacturing facility. And um, that's where uh, Airjet Rocketdyne is going to be producing 3D printed components and all their advanced composite structures. Um, local startup Dynetics uh, also has a firm toehold in the space industry and, de and defense industry. On the SLS program, Dynetics has delivered the stage launch, the, uh, the vehicle stage adapter. So that's the connector point.
point between the uh, the core stage and the upper stages. Lockheed Martin and Boeing, of course, have a large and growing footprint here, uh, supporting NASA and a lot of defense activities. And there are a host of other manufacturers here who uh, supply components to the launch industry. So Teledyne Brown and Brown Precision and GE uh, has opened up a new ceramic matrix composite uh, tape production facility, RUAG manufactures huge composite structures, fairings for rockets here. Um, but the space industry is not just launch. It's obviously what you do while you're in space and then how, how you use that data when you get back to Earth. Uh, Marshall, the Marshall Space Flight Center is going to continue to have an important role in space exploration too. So Marshall uh, will manage the lunar lander program. So uh, so the, the vehicle is actually going to descend to the, to the lunar surface is going to be managed at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, that's going to be used on the Artemis 3 mission. So there's Artemis 1 that's coming up in 2021. And then a year or so after that, they're going to put a crew on that vehicle. They're going to take it to the moon. They're not going to land. But in 2024, they're planning to actually uh, land uh, people on the, on the lunar surface. And Marshall is probably going to have some other responsibilities for various uh, parts of the lunar mission. Um, the, right now, as I mentioned before, the Marshall Space Flight Center manages all the payload operations, all the science that's done on the International Space Station is managed uh, by the uh, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, and, and Marshall also does all the advanced manufacturing uh, materials and research and development activities. Um, so uh, NASA also, of course, I mentioned earlier, all the science being done on the station is being managed by the Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, Boeing manages the ECLIS, which is the life support system on the space station that's reclaiming all the, all the water uh, on the system. They're just upgrading it. Right now it's about 80%, um, 85% uh, efficient. They, they, they've just got a new upgrade. They're going to go to about 98% efficiency uh, in the reclamation of water. Uh, and that system, of course, makes ox oxygen also for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the astronauts up there. So, so what do you do with the data and the material that you that you gather while you're in space? Um, the um, so early in Huntsville Mayor Tommy Battle's uh, first term, he's now well into his third term. Uh, he initiated three technology incubation efforts around cyber around power and geospatial technologies. Uh, I think in the long time, a couple of those initiatives are going to kind of reinforce our space footprint. Uh, there's a host of other smaller companies involved in space vehicles and satellite uses. Um, um, uh, I won't go through all those right now. But it's, uh, this is kind of the, the most interesting play that the community is making. Uh, Sierra Nevada uh, has been awarded a contract to resupply the space station uh, with cargo. Uh, using its Dream Chaser vehicle. Slightly different from this, but you get the idea. It, so it looks a lot like a space sh uh, shuttle, except for terrifically smaller. Huntsville is the only community that's currently pursuing a license to land uh, the, the Dream Chaser space vehicle at uh, General Aviation a Airport. And we, we hope and expect to have a mission uh, to land here. And I hope y'all y'all will come back for that uh, to see this thing land. Um, so, but uh, I hope you see that Huntsville, you know, it, even though the space industry is growing up all around us and it's a lot more diverse than it once was, it's no longer this monolith of, of NASA, um, Huntsville continues to have a bright future, I think, in, in space and space exploration. And so we don't really intend to relinquish the Rocket City title anytime soon. So I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you today. And I've, I've intentionally reserved a little time for, for questions and answers, if y'all if have any that... I might be able to handle.